Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Business Boot Camps for Writers event with the Authors Guild Foundation. This series is supported by the National Endowment for the Arts and Penguin Random House. So a big thank you to all our supporters who allow us to offer these programs free and open to the public. We're here for a discussion on your legal rights and making your contracts work for you. Uh, when you're excited about getting a book deal, it's easy to gloss over the fine print, but the contract has enormous implications on your income and rights and liabilities. So it's important to know what to look for. Uh, thank you to those of us who submitted questions for the panelists already and feel free to use the Q&A box below uh, to type in questions uh, if they come up and we'll answer as many as we can today. Uh, joining us now is my friend Umair Kazi, the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Authors Guild. He studied law at the University of Iowa and creative writing at Columbia University. And we have Agent Adam Shear, who is a graduate of Tulane and Cardozo School of Law. He currently serves on the board of directors of the Association of American Literary Agents, AALA, uh, formerly the AAR, uh, and he's on the AALA Contracts Committee. He began his publishing career at the William Morris Agency and joined De Fiore and Company in 2009. So Umer and Adam, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Johnny, for that wonderful, implica uh, <laughs> wonderful introduction. Um, so, I was thinking that we could start a little bit, Adam, because of your um, unique experience, both in, you know, both as having studied law and also um, uh, negotiations, we could maybe start with a little bit of a background on how um, negotiations began with a publisher, like when a publisher expresses, you send out a, a, a submission and the publisher expresses interest, like how does, how do the gears start turning? What do you think about what considerations you take into account. Hi, yeah, thanks for having me and thank you for the introduction. Um, it's a great question. Uh, so yes, uh, there's usually um, uh, oftentimes when you're going through the process with a literary agent, which will be usually the, the way the process goes, um, there's oftentimes a point person, a point literary agent, you're, you're a literary agent, um, and many uh, agencies have somebody on staff to also handle contract negotiation, or perhaps they use an outside uh, law firm or contracts specialist. Uh, and sometimes that agent will handle it directly uh, on their own. Um, my agency, uh, we have agents who represent the authors and I am the uh, contracts director uh, and I'm the one who will handle the contract negotiation. Uh, I'm also an agent. I also represent my own clients. Um, so I kind of have the perspective of both uh, to weigh in here. And when I'm making a deal, the first uh, person I'm, as an agent, I am talking to the editor. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking to the publisher's contracts person. Um, mm -hmm. So that phase, there's usually, um, a deal memo that can be done, or sometimes you do it a little more casually and it'll be an email exchange back and forth. Um, and oftentimes it's kind of a hybrid of the two uh, where maybe the publisher will send over a deal memo um, or the editor will, um, and I'll look at it, I'll analyze it, I'll go back to them with some notes, some changes, they'll send you know back to me and we'll go back and forth on that a little bit. Um, but at the end of the day, a deal memo, which is basically just a rundown of the main deal points and that email exchange isn't binding on the publisher. It's not binding on you. Um, there's a good faith understanding that you're going to honor the terms of those uh, uh, negotiations. Um, and in practice, that's the way it, it happens. You know, uh, for a publisher to go back on a deal memo would be really shocking. Mm -hmm. um, and the same should go for the agent and the author. Uh, so it is really important to get those, those deal memo terms really specific. And as for what I look for, it kind of depends on whether or not I've done a deal with that publisher before. Uh, agencies will um, negotiate a standard boilerplate with a publisher. And that boilerplate will be heavily negotiated. Um, this is just a blank contract. Um, we will go with a fine tooth comb on every line and see if it can be improved. Um, we know all the standards, the things that there is wiggle room on, the things that they, the publisher is putting their, their foot down. We push the boundaries wherever we can. 
Um, and we really try and get the best terms for the author. So if we've got this very negotiated, very established boilerplate with a publisher, I can rely on that in the deal memo and I don't need to get into every detail with them. Uh, and I can really just focus on you know, the payout, the advance level, the royalty structure, the subright splits, um, making sure that there's the, if there's any approval or consultation that I know is particularly important to the author, um, that's something I'm thinking about. Um, and, and to that end, if there's anything that I know this author needs that goes against that heavily negotiated boilerplate, that might be something I'm really thinking about at this stage too, because in that situation, I might be saying to the publisher, I know we've got our boilerplate. I know it's established. Mm -hmm. This is a unique situation for this author. And I would like to see it changed in this case. Uh, and sometimes they'll say, okay, we can do that, but only this time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can maybe push the envelope like that and see if we can change the boilerplate bit by bit that way. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, uh, you want a really well-established boilerplate. You want that process to be smooth because mm -hmm. the process of negotiating these boilerplates can take a very long time. And if that was required for every deal, yeah. it would be excessive. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't want to go too long on this, but I will say if I'm doing a deal with a publisher where there, I know we don't have a boilerplate, mm -hmm. that's when my deal memo will get more specific. I'll, I'll make sure things go in that I know are really important that uh, aren't necessarily going to be guaranteed in their boilerplate. Uh, and I'll always talk about what rights are granted. That's also hugely important in a deal memo, um, whether or not it's uh, any specific sub rights, you know, language, territory. These are incredibly important deal terms that you want to make sure are very clear from the get go. And, and those um, just th those those and we will go further into um, sub rights and territory and languages in a in a second here. But I just want to. Um, set the stage i guess for you know when you actually get that document and you know the preliminaries that happen prior to that document um the the this could depart from the boilerplate right like or do you do you have have you negotiated that you know with certain publishers you will always give them foreign rights i mean not always as in like as a default you'll you'll let them have foreign rights unless the author has like a very specific sort of you know request about it yeah, it's a really good question. So um, there are some rights mm -hmm. that have become less uh, up for grabs or less open for negotiation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking of audio rights right. specifically. Audio rights are really, really, really tough to retain for an author at this stage. Publishers just think they're part of the bundle of rights that they should be getting. Um, and there's been a really hard line drawn on that. Um, it's not to say it can't ever happen, but that's one that it's pretty rare. You, you go into a negotiation assuming that that's going to be what they're going to want. Mm -hmm. um, and that's understood. Mm -hmm. uh, as for like translation rights, oh, mm -hmm. and on the flip side of things, there are things that we just like, we never grant. And just with any publisher, it's so incredibly rare, mm -hmm. um, like film TV rights, things like that. Um, they can be really, really rare to grant. Again, there are some exceptions to this. Uh, there are publishers that really insist on it, but um, there are rights that you always are going to hold on to. And then there's a bunch that are just in between. Uh, it's really rare to have a boilerplate specify which rights are automatically going to be granted. Mm -hmm. uh, out of the main ones that are tend to be up for, for negotiation, uh, it's really deal specific. Mm -hmm. This is, yeah, this is really helpful. Um because I think oftentimes we begin the conversation with the document, but, you know, so much goes, goes in prior to that. And, you know, we focused on here, we kind of focused on how an, an agent sort of um, um, uh, navigates that process. But even if you're an unagented author, um, you might be the, the, to the point that Adam made earlier, you know, when you exchange emails, those emails, even if it's not a formal, doc formal document, um, are kind of uh, creating the stage for you, for what you might get in the formal document. And then, you know, you can sort of look at the document and, 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 and say what is acceptable to you um, and what's not acceptable to you. So, oh yeah, and I will just really quickly add yeah. that um, when you get the contract in, 
the first thing you do is take a look at that deal memo and see if it reflects the things mm -hmm. that were agreed to, because there's plenty of times where the contracts person, um, you know, the editor is the one who agrees to all the right. substantive deal memo points and the contracts person maybe interprets it differently or doesn't notice a specific term. Mm -hmm. And then, you, you know, first thing to do is make sure it matches what was agreed to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so maybe um, I think I think now that we've set the stage for what sort of the, the big areas um, that you talk about, um, you know, prior to getting the contract, which would be uh, the scope of, of rights that are granted, um, you know, some payment terms, perhaps are advance and, and royalties, um, those, those um, and, you know, foreign rights and sub rights of that sort. So maybe at, following from that, we can um, kind of turn towards the sort of big um, and important uh, provisions of uh, that are present in any publishing contract that um, um, that authors should always review very carefully um, because it can have a lot of long term consequences. Um, but also, you know, maybe understand what these provisions are doing. I think uh, I think for this presentation, I also sort of want to touch on what why what is going on in a publishing contract and kind of like, you know, um, 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 uh, uh, a, a basic sort of philosophical sense. So I'll just, I'll just, you know, and Adam, like anything, you know, you, that comes to mind as I'm kind of like going through some of these points, you know, please feel free to jump in. Um, so uh, the so when you when when you look at a publishing contract, there's there's a lot of language, you know, there, there's a lot of provisions, very um, that that kind of set your rights uh, with respect to the publisher, your responsibilities for what you're supposed to do uh, under the terms of the contract, the publisher's responsibilities for what they're supposed to do. Um, but the 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 main um, sort of there there are a couple of things that are that are the essence of a publishing contract. One is the grant of rights, and two is you know, what you get in return for giving a publisher those rights. Um, the, I'm sure a lot of people here attending this webinar are at least basically aware of copyright, which is you know, an author's quite possibly most important asset. Um, the grant of rights provision of a publishing contract sets the terms on which the publisher can makes use of the work, um, you know, literally the the rights that you have as an author um, under copyright, which you hand over to the publisher to exercise in your in your stead. Um, and um, because copyright is such a fundamental sort of bedrock um, part of a publishing contract, I just want to touch on a few um, sort of conceptual issues, conceptual features of copyright, um, so that are germane to our discussion here. Um, um, and others might, you know, people might already know this, um, but uh, copyright is not one right, it's a bundle of six exclusive rights, um, the right to reproduce um, a work, the right to distribute copies of the work, the right to create new works called derivative works, which, you know, for example, would be a film production, audio rights, uh, audiobook, podcast, um, uh, the right to publicly perform um, the, the work, which also implicates, um, uh, you know, dramatic adaptation, uh, adaptations of a work, and the right to publicly display the work. Um, it's the, the grant of rights language in a publishing contract may vary, you, you know, a publisher might say, uh, you give us the right, right to print, produce, and sell the work in um, you know, hardcover, softcover, ebook, uh, and audio forms, and to authorize others to do the same. Um, that's just one example of it. Whatever the grant grant of rights, however it's termed, um, actually always relates back to these fundamental six rights. So, you know, like when you say film rights, it's it's film rights are the ability to you know have the uh, the ability to create a derivative work. Um, which is an exclusive right, and to sort of perform the work. So, so those, the, the language may be different, but what I'm trying to say is that it kind of goes back to the rights under copyright. And copyright comes into existence when you write the work. It's there already, um, and uh, it lasts uh, for 70 years uh, from the, the, the demise of the author. Um, so the heirs can also benefit from it. Um, so you have, this, you have these rights. 
um, right? And you know, Adam, you 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 also as a as as a lawyer, like you you kind of see the the what what you you probably look at the language of a publishing contract um, in in often in context of those rights, and and you know, if there's the language can be broad sometimes, right? So. Um, you know, throughout the world, if you give the publisher uh, 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 the right to uh, print, publish, and sell the work throughout the world, that's that's broader than you know in U.S. territories, Canada. So, um, but do you um, just I guess like here, I'm I just want to sort of ask you if there is, um, you know, you 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 it you pay a lot of attention to exactly how that 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 provision is termed and written. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, if if anybody out there is looking at a contract on their own without a lawyer, without an agent, um, my first advice would be to to hire a professional um, who is familiar with these uh, contracts in particular. Um, there are plenty of lawyers who um, do IP, but IP can cover a lot of different types of things. And right. um, it's really helpful to have someone who knows the norms of the industry. Absolutely. Um, and in this regard, um, but but my second advice would be to really look at this grant of rights language in your contract, because um, you can always negotiate a contract. Uh, the first version of it, you can always push back on. Um, and the language here sometimes can be worded in ways that are very, very broad and covers a lot of that bundle of rights that you just really uh, uh, perfectly described. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's a question of whether or not publishers should have every possible sub right and and whether they're not. And obviously, I'm of the position that there's quite a lot of those rights that should be retained for an author. Um, and, uh, you know, the wording in that clause, if it could be interpreted to cover all of those rights, then that's what is going to be upheld. Um, and if you push back and say, no, I'd like it to be made very clearly what specific rights does a publisher get in this contract and what specific rights am I retaining as the author, then I think it's going to serve you really well. And that's certainly a thing that I do quite a lot of. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like every, uh, every lawyer is just like, just be as precise and clear and narrow as possible. You know, um, even if your contract doesn't have a separate sub right section, don't think that you might not be granting those rights because you're uh, the, the 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 tiny little paragraph at the top, the grant of rights clause might say, oh yeah, publisher has the right to create and authorize others to create any derivative work they want. So by, as an example, you know, that language has already sort of, you know, given the publisher film rights and, and, and any other, any other right. Um, uh, a uh, couple of things that I always sort of, um, that authors, I think, you know, I mean, there's so much to, to sort of really watch out for and like like you said you know if you even if you don't have an agent um you can get an attorney or of course you know join the author's guild and we'll we'll review your contract for you and give you um negotiating points but um but there's um um yeah i mean you know one thing that at least like one thing that you know if you don't take away anything like one thing just the biggest red flag often is like if the publisher is saying you um transfer all of your rights to us you know that's a no-no or if you're if you're if your contract uh, we'll talk a little bit about term and termination and uh, that was my next point but um the if the contract says you know you grant us this right in perpetuity um all rights under copyright or you know you assign us the copyright to the work that just means that you've given the publisher almost you know carte blanche to do whatever they want with the work um and oftentimes like you don't want to do that because no no contract will be so defined as to have like and you know as to have a a fair and equitable and and negotiated um uh, share or return for you in that contract for the the very expansive grant of rights that you give if you if you transfer copyright essentially making the publisher um uh, owner of the work um, so rights are, are oftentimes in most publishing contracts, authors will grant rights for the duration of copyright, which does seem um, unfair and inordinately long. I mean, it's like if it's the most important asset that you have as an author, why are you giving it to someone for, you know, your life and then and then some 
you know, like 70 years after that. Um, so the, 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 it, it's true that the most, that's sort of convention that, that, that's what, what you grant um, rights for, but the publishing contracts will often have um, a termination clause or otherwise also known as an out of print clause that uh, essentially ends the grant earlier um, when the publisher's done um, exploiting the work. And I'll cover that in a little bit, as well as a second um, um, way you can get your rights back as an author. Uh, but before that, before, before we get our rights back, uh, we wanna make sure that we are getting paid while we, you know, while we are in contract. And um, the, 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 some of the things that I wanna touch on here are, how do you get paid? So most, you know, everyone probably here already knows uh, the concept of royalties, which is a share of what you get from a book sale. Um, and an advance, the concept of an advance, which is what you get often in installments when you when you decide that you're publishing the book with a publisher, um, that's theoretically supposed to help you kind of, um, um, it, it's kind of help you um, manage your finances prior to publication before the money starts, you know, rolling in and the, uh, <laughs> and the, and yeah, sorry, I was, <laughs> I was trying to go for like some sort of elaborate met metaphor about, um, you know, enormous earnings from, from publishing, but, uh, you know, my imagination failed me there. <laughs> um, so you, um, the, the, the things that, the takeaway there is like the share that you get from book sales is going to be either based on the book's list price, which is the price that's printed on the on the on the book jacket, and or uh, this other term called net receipts. Um, it used to be more common for publishers to pay on list price, and now Adam, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think outside of the big five, um, most publishers don't pay on the list or cover price anymore. No. Oh, well, I don't know if I would okay. go as far as saying that most don't. Um, mm. And I think it depends on on the type of publisher, the genre. Um, I see plenty of, of, I mean, goodness, at this point, uh, half of the medium-sized independent publishers are now part of the big five as of right. this past year. There's right. been quite a lot of consolidation um, right. this year. Um, yeah. But uh, even with some of the indies, um, Quite a lot of them, uh, the the main rights, the like main hardcover paperback, trade paperback, mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes will be on on suggested retail price. Uh, I do see quite a number that are moving over to uh, net receipts, mm -hmm. um, and there's no inherent um, one being better than the other uh, as long as the numbers match up. You know, uh, you know, if something's based on net receipts, the percentage would need to be higher. Yeah. Um, uh, of a royalty to match what it would be on suggested yep. retail price. Uh, and yep. that's a bit complicated. We're getting really nitty gritty into yeah. the details, yeah. but that's the big takeaway. It should be a good deal higher for it to end up being the same amount of money in an author's pocket. Right, right. Yeah, um, and, and I was gonna go into that. I, I know it does get super sort of uh, uh, granular and, 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 and technical, but I, I do want to sort of define this concept a little bit of net receipts because um, it's just such an important, uh, you know, it's in such an important contract, uh, you know, concept, even if it's not in your, in your, in your contract, uh, you'll, you'll likely see it at some point. And um, that is basically um, the price. So, so the suggested retail, retail price is the price that's, that's stamped on the book. Net receipts is closer to the price the book is actually sold at. It's, it's, it's very specifically the, the money that the publisher gets after um, bookstore discounts, uh, taxes, and, and sometimes, you know, other kinds of distribution fees. And in the, in the book supply chain, there are quite a few different intermediaries and everyone gets like a, a slight cut. So, um, and, and the biggest cut here uh, often tends to be um, the bookstores to to in, to entice bookstores to actually carry the book and sell the book publishers uh, customarily give them discounts and um, you know um, um, a player like Amazon for instance may say oh you know we we need like a 50% discount from what the price that you've actually printed on the book to actually carry this book um, and so what that means is that like 
if a book is is uh, the suggested retail price is ten dollars, um, you know the discount is three dollars and the tax is one dollar and then one dollar and other fees. The publisher is getting back five dollars. And if your royalty rate is ten percent, you're getting ten percent of five dollars. Um, if you're getting paid on net receipts, as opposed to ten percent of uh, ten dollars if you're getting paid on the book's list price. So that is that is the big difference. There's a your 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 the ultimate dollar amount that you get from the sales could be um, thirty to forty percent less um, if your if your royalties are being calculated on net receipts than if they're being calculated on on list price. Um, if the royalty amount is the same, right? If yeah. the royalty amount, if the royalty percentage, uh, yes, yes, yeah. you're right. The, the, the percentage is the same. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, and um, yeah, so um, that's sort of the the kind of very high level overview of of the uh, payment uh, sort of uh, provisions in a contract. You'll also, yeah. in in many cases, you'll have an advance. Clause, uh, you'll get part of the advance on signing of the contract, part on when you, you know, you deliver the manuscript. Generally, it's acceptance of manuscript, and and then perhaps a, a third one on publication. Um, yeah, and they can be split even more than that. I mean, it kind of yeah. depends on the level of the advance. Oftentimes, mm -hmm. publish, publishers will say the bigger the advance, the more they kind of need to split it up over mm -hmm. different payments. And, you know, that can be one of the deal points that you negotiate. That's part of a deal by deal situation. Obviously, we prefer it when there's more money earlier in the process. Right. Um, and uh, sometimes there'll be payments that are a year after publication, which raises the question of how is that in advance? But I guess exactly. I'm making the argument that it's in advance against the royalties that are yet to come. That are um, still, still, still being, still in, still being earned. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, um, the time frames are often uh, something. Well, usually they're pretty, you know, signing DNA pub. Um, but you can also talk about like fail safes that kick in in case like maybe their publication got delayed. So is there any way to make sure that 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 advance doesn't get just perpetually delayed as well? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right. Absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah, there's uh, again, like it just goes back to so much of the, you know, we can talk about the high level points. But again, you just it just goes so much to the letter of the contract, because it, yeah. there's all of these places where you will want to protect yourself from eventualities that, you know, may not occur but they very well could. Um, and you don't want to find yourself in a situation where you've you know, written this manuscript, you've done all the work, everything's going well. And then something um, very, you know, I mean, at this point, I've seen so many different sort of iterations of this, like very, sometimes very unlikely scenarios can sort of lead the publisher to maybe want to get out of the contract. Um, and at that point, you want to make sure that you are protected, so you are not, you know, you're not suddenly like stuck with a with a bill for the advance. You can you can take your work somewhere else, um, etc. Yeah, um, and I'll just say that a lot, a lot of times I'll have people ask me like, well, what are what are the rules? What does the law say about these things? And oftentimes they'll say, what does the contract say about this? Yeah, because that's what it comes down to. Um, if the contract says this is what's going to happen. If this happens, then that's what happens. If the exactly. contract is silent about it, then there's a lot of, oftentimes there's a lot of uncertainty. So Absolutely. get that wording in the contract. Absolutely. Get that wording in the contract. Make sure the wording is, you know, fair towards you. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's because once you sign it, you know, I mean, the law assumes that, you know, you've, if you've signed a contract, there's an assumption that you've understood what you're getting into, you know, unless there's like, other sort of um, you know contractual defects like the language is clearly ambiguous or uh, etc. So that is why very important um, um, and you know make sure that you know the 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 publisher um, publishers usually send out a royalty statements twice a year. They they most publishers have a two six month accounting periods and um, the statements uh, generally will cover how many books they have sold, information on any sub licenses. Um, um, and oftentimes the book's lifetime sales. Um, and again, you know, just as much as it, it's, it's Im important to look at a contract and, and, and really go through it with a fine tooth comb, it's also important to look at every royalty statement and, and really, you know, 
save them if you can. <laughs> I've um, I've had situations where you know someone will come up and there's uh, they realize that there was some sort of like you know bad practice going on or they're concerned or 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 just they just haven't received royalty statements in a long time and um you know they just don't have any copies of of these documents and um you know again like it's a it's a it's it's a legal um engagement that you are getting into for a very long time you know that it, it for you know at, at least a decade sometimes you know five years depending on when when the book goes out of print so make sure that you have you you keep a record and have everything um well, uh, we, all, we, we, we've talked about sublicense and subsidiary rights here, um, and I just quickly want to sort of explain what they, what these concepts yeah. refer to. Um, so any rights that you have within copyright are exclusive to you. That means, you know, the very beginning, first instance, only you can use them. Um, you can authorize someone else to exercise those rights, which is what a publishing contract does, but you can also exercise that someone to give someone else um the ability to to exercise the same right so as almost like a pass through so a subsidiary right is is essentially where the publishers not exercising that right but they have given it to someone else often you know oftentimes it's uh we talk about foreign editions and and translation editions and uh, translated editions and and that's what they're referring to because um us publisher in most cases probably doesn't have distribution in in brazil um, and they'll engage a Brazilian publisher and a translator to make the book available there. Um, and same goes for sort of film because most publishers don't have like in-house film production capabilities. Um, okay, so well, very quickly, I because I think uh, we we have about, I think we wanna maybe spend like ten, the last 10 minutes answering questions. So um, I'm, I'll very quickly kind of touch on the the final thing that I want to touch on about a publishing contract, which is uh, the out of print and termination. Um, if uh, again, you know, if you if your contract doesn't have anything that says this contract will end, that's probably a red flag, because that means that you've given rights for, uh, more, you know, life plus 70 years, as long as as long as there's copyright in the work. Um, so yeah. make sure that there is uh, some sort of provision that um, allows you to get your rights back. Oftentimes it's when the publisher is no longer selling the book and there's definitions of out of print. Um, Adam, I'm, I'm always interested in this, in the out of print language. Um, and I wanna sort of get your sense as an agent. Um, do, you, uh, do you see a lot of like POD um, um, kind of uses and the publisher sort of trying to say, okay, we're book still in print, even though we're just printing one copy at a time. Absolutely, this is incredibly important. Um, uh, the out of print clause uh, is your main way of getting the rights back. There are a few other possibilities, and that should also be in the contract. You know, make it clear if they, you know, uh, breached their, you know, uh, promises in their contract uh, on their end that there are ways for. Uh, um, rights to revert in that situation. Um, but for out of print, uh, the question that I ask is always, um, is there someone who's able to get an actual copy of the book in the main language where the rights were sold, um, in the country where the rights were sold? Uh, and it, does it require the publisher to do anything to make that happen? Um, so if they need to keep it in stock in the warehouse, physical copies, usually that's enough. It's a pretty low bar, um, but uh, you know that low bar needs to the publisher needs to spend money, you know, to keep it in the warehouse to keep copies in. Uh, with the rise of eBooks, with the rise of print-on-demand technology, uh, it's become clear that there could be copies that are able to be um, purchased that require absolutely no money whatsoever from the publisher. They just need to keep it available as a download. And in that situation, it essentially makes the the um, uh, uh, out of print clause meaningless because it'll always be available. So it's pretty standard, pretty easy for, for you to raise this issue with a publisher. And you know they'll come up with some solution like a, a certain threshold of dollar sales or a certain number of copies sold, some sort of protection that makes it clear that there still needs to be 
people buying the book for it to remain in print. And, right. and that's a very common discussion. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. You, because the whole idea of a publishing contract is that the publisher does some legwork. I mean, they're printing the book, they're marketing the book um, for them to sort of continue to have uh, control over, over the rights. So, um, and I do want to say, yes, we, um, I, I sort of, I, 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 referring back to what you said about monetary thresholds um this is something that the guild this is an issue that the guild's been working on quite a quite a while and um in our in our model contracts there's always been a suggested language when we do our reviews um we always sort of look at this issue in particular and suggest language to make sure that the author is continue is 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 getting something as long as the book is um available you know there there's other ways you could you could look at a contract and say oh okay like if copies were sold but then there could be another part of your contract that says that um you know copies sold at a at a deep discount won't earn you any royalty so in that case the book could still be out of print and copies be selling but you're not getting anything so these are just sort of i mean i know we're getting sort of in the weeds there but um but just just uh sort of circle back again to the point of uh, just being so vigilant and, and and getting expert opinion on contracts um you know the authors guild we we've been reviewing contracts for i i know everyone here is on the ag webinar and <laughs> uh for um but i do want to say that you know please do send in your contracts to our wonderful legal services team um we i, I also want to talk about our model contract which I'm, I'm 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 certain a lot of people are already aware of um we uh the, the guild's always sort of striving to make publishing terms equitable and fair for authors, um, especially, you know, as new uses and new technologies come on the horizon. Um, and especially for authors who don't have, um, you know, the, the, the benefit of having um, an experienced agent, um, uh, you know, work on the contract with them. So we have a model contract. Um, we, we've been publishing it for decades. I, I forget, maybe I think the 60s. Um, but um, we last year we decided to, uh, for the first time, um, to make the model contract available to everybody, not just um, Authors Guild members. And any agent, anyone interested in book publishing um, can access our model contract now uh, on our website. And um, I think as a follow up to the webinar, um, we'll send an email to all the participants and that, that, that email will, will contain um, these clauses. Um, um, sorry, these the links to the model contract and also to some of the other um, informational um, um, writing, um, some of the other blogs that we've written on getting your rights back, etc. cetera, um, um, to sort of expand on the issues we've dis discussed here. Um, so let's see here. Uh, we're still, we're doing pretty well on time. Um, Adam, do you have anything else that you want to say about, uh, you, know, you know, just anything that we've talked about before we maybe, you know, move on to uh, New Horizons? Uh, you know, we, we, we packed a lot in, but like we, we like we could have gone in the nitty gritty on every single clause in a, in a standard contract and filled this entire time up. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I want to be very specific to think about exactly what to raise. Um, you know, when we mentioned sub rights, I will just say a lot of times people think about um, selling, uh, you get your advance and then you start earning royalties. And that's like the main kind of balance of things. But sub rights are so important. You know, if you sell translation rights, like we talked about to a publisher and that publisher then sells, you know, those Portuguese rights and those French rights and German rights and all over the world and they get advances for every single one of them, you often get a split of that advance. Um, and that split will be will be de detailed in your contract and that your portion of that goes to earn out your advance so if that happens you might earn out your advance before the book even goes on sale mm -hmm. um it, it's a very important revenue stream that authors should make sure they they think quite a lot about um the other thing that i i guess i'll i'll, I'll mention is um the big discussion in contracts right now is morality clauses yeah uh, these are very complex very interesting issue um and we could uh, talk the entire time about right. them yeah but and uh we have in the guild and the aia we we've been sort of looking at the the morality clause issue in quite some detail the model contract actually i just want to say we 
we did uh, uh, we understand that there's a lot of a um, lot of publishers are sort of digging in their heels and they're saying we want these clauses we want to be able to protect ourselves if something happens you know if the author uh, comes under uh, some you know d disrepute and you know then we can pull the book um, I guess like I'll just say you know a morality clause is is it used to be pretty much like we always we, we mostly ever saw them in 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 religious publishing contracts where yeah. um if the author's conduct in some way deviates from you know the the deviates from yeah this is deviant <laughs> in certain ways uh then the publisher could cancel the contract and yeah. um yeah recently we've started seeing them in pretty much you know any big trade publishing contracts and um, what we have tried to do in the model contract is to make the clause very specific, you know, that the publisher cannot terminate unless there is, um, you know, there's something documented or there's actual, uh, you know, legal action being taken against the author. Um, and, um, you know, what sorts of justifications does the publisher need to provide before they can exercise um, their right to terminate? Um, yeah. And yeah, um, it's a it's a tricky it's a tricky time. That's 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 certainly a big big one. Yeah, and it feels like the wild west right now with it. There's it's there's people they're, they're coming up with with all new language, and then you push back, and there's a, a lot of um, uh, negotiation happening around them. Um, a big thing I think about is audience. Like, it, it is right. is the language talking about the book's intended audience or not? Because um, that's a big question about. Um, when you're writing something and there's a scandal happening, is it um, a scandal in the audience that had no interest in buying your book originally? You know, does the clause address that type of situation? Mm -hmm. And I think these are really important questions to be thinking through. Uh, so if you get a contract that has something in, like that in there, read it very closely, think about the wording. And um, yeah, I would I would give a lot of thought to them before signing. Yeah. So, so you mean like uh, when when the last example that you mentioned is actually if if there if a book's coming out especially about like a certain type of controversy, or like you know the the book's aim is to maybe stir controversy and we're we're yeah. I mean, a, a goofy example I often give is if it's a book about a rock star and they're getting uh, um, bad press because they trash their hotel room. Like, mm. is that? Um, just because we're talking about canceling the contract. So, right. um, and, and there's uh -huh. usually broad ability to do that. So, right. you know, uh, is that take, is that type of situation discussed in the clause or not? Um, right. I know they're kind of absurd examples, but yeah. sometimes you got to think about this type yeah. of, um, just as, as a, as a way to approach the clause. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's, that's a not, 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 because this is again, not, not to go down this rabbit hole, but the rock star example, I mean, that you could, make a strong argument that that's actually part of the <laughs> the reputation right. of the it's part of the brand yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. so um yeah and you know it goes to all sorts of questions about like whether or not the, the publishers should have foreseen a rock star would trash their room uh, right and obviously um, there are like very more extreme of uh, uh, examples there um and you try and find the balance of like the situation because mm -hmm. at the end of the day the clause is about the publisher's ability to terminate the contract. That that's it. Like it's it's you get um, kind of very wrapped up in questions about morality, and it's really interesting to think that through. Um, but at the end of the day, the clause is about a publisher's ability to cancel a contract. Um, Absolutely. And so, um, how does that play out? Um, reading it very closely, thinking yeah. through all the possible uh, uh, versions of it, and and who, you know, it, it's also very easy to like. Um, agree with it when you agree with the person making the decision, but you know, um, these clauses are for the life of, these contracts are for the life of copyright. So um, right. you have to really think through all possible permutations. Yeah, and and you know, to that point where cancellation by the publisher is, uh, is not, you know, I mean, it's not true. I mean, I'm sure every author knows how hard it is to get published. So, you know, you get to up, up to a certain point and um, you've already invested all this time and, and then the book gets canceled. Uh, more so if the publisher is asking for whatever they've paid you already back. I mean, those are very sort of serious situations that that authors yeah. um, need to be mindful of and make sure that your contract 
um, has language that that insulates you from 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 that sort of blowback. Um, so we um, have 15 minutes. Um, Johnny, do you? Uh, I mean, I could, I could, I, I have a, I, you know, I can You've ask got a lot of questions, questions or yeah. I, yeah, I saw that we have a lot well, of questions, so maybe we should just move to the Q and A so we can. Sure, sure. So uh, first, we had a few uh, requests for clarification. Um, if you could define deal memo. Yeah, uh, well, a deal memo is just uh, an exchange. Sometimes it's a formal document. Sometimes it's just like in, a, in, a, in an email, but um, it's setting out the main deal terms uh, and both parties are agreeing to it. Um, now, I've heard some people say that deal memos are completely unenforceable. I've heard some people say that um, they are legally binding. Um, at the end of the day, in practice for me, I've not had to confront it because a publisher is going to honor the deal memo. Uh, because if they didn't, then that would be a big problem back and forth with the agency. And um, so uh, they are important to get very, very accurate, um, but they really are just kind of spelling out, here's the advance, here are the rights that are being granted, here are the royalties, here are the subright splits, you know, the main kind of big uh, deal points that change from contract to contract. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a term you mentioned, DNA. What does that mean? Delivery and acceptance. It's when the publisher, uh, you send the book, the manuscript to the publisher, and the editor reads it over and says, yes, I've accepted this as, as a, a good manuscript. Um, usually, there'll be clauses in the contract that say the editor can reject it and say, no, you've sent me something that's so bad, I'm not accepting this manuscript. And there are things that happen after that and that are spelled out in the contract. Uh, and acceptance is you know, the opposite, saying, yes, this is the manuscript we're going to take for, forward into like, copy editing. OK. Uh, in general, what would you say are uh, some good points that often get negotiated in the author's favor? And what are some red flags, uh, some deal breakers that, that tend to come up? Mm -hmm. um, you know. I find the biggest one for me is the author puts a book out into the world. It's got their name on it. People read the book assuming that the words that were in the text were there, were from the author. Uh, so I always want to make it clear that the publisher can't change the author's work um, without the author's approval. This is a big red flag for me. There are some publishers that really dig in on this and say, no, we need to be able to edit the book. And, and I say, I argue back, well, that's part of the process of acceptance that we just talked about, that if you say you don't like the book, you can accept it or reject it or ask for revisions. And, and that should be all spelled out in the contract. But at the end of the day, once the, the book's been accepted, I don't think a publisher should be able to change the work of the author and put it out under their name. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, that goes for title, that goes for a, a, a number of, of things like that. Um, but there are publishers that push back on, on that. And sometimes at the end of the day, uh, to me, that's a red flag, but not like a, this is a shady publisher. There are some publishers that are very reputable that just have a policy. I guess they've been burnt too many times and they say, no, at the end of the day, we need the ability to you know, tweak something uh, and adjust it if, if, if we need to. Um, it's a term I, I don't like and I fight tooth and nail every time I see it. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, without I mean approval is is yeah can be hard to get you know consultation though that doesn't really create a a, a bright line you know um, or like a stable legal standard um, approval maybe the compromise is approval uh, not to be unreasonably withheld <laughs> so that kind of language gets thrown in lots of spots yeah yeah. yeah. Uh, Adam, if you could speak a little to uh, the value that an agent provides. If someone is comfortable negotiating a contract for themselves, uh, should they still want an agent? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, the value an agent provides is 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 manifold. Um, and, you know, it's not just for the contract. You know, a lot of times, a lot of publishers won't look at manuscripts unless they come through an agent. Um, an agent does a huge amount of editorial work uh, with their writers uh, as well, oftentimes. Um, and so there's quite a lot of value that 
is added before we even get to that uh, contract stage. And there's a lot of value added after that as well. You know, we are in many ways, the advocate for the author. We're, we're the party whose interests 100% align with the author. Um, you know, publishers are on your team, but you know, they have other interests as well. Um, and an author gets paid when the author gets paid, or an agent gets paid when the author gets paid uh, at the end of the day. Um, so at, after the contract sign, we also provide quite a lot of value in, in being the advocate for the author. If you know the author hates the cover um, and you want to say, hey, you know, it's one thing for an author to go back to a publisher and say, we don't, I don't really like the cover. Uh, and that can have quite a, an important um, uh, impact, but for the agent also to say, hey, we really don't like this cover can help, you know, amplify that voice and and and, and be part of uh, part of that process as well. Uh, and for every decision until and after the book is published. But as for the contract, um, the biggest, I'd say, benefit agencies provide for authors is the fact that we do deal after deal after deal with publishers. Um, we establish very uh, author favorable boilerplates with them. We negotiate their standard boilerplates left and right to get it to be a really fair spot for an author. Um, and when you're doing a deal, you're getting the benefit of all the prior negotiations that went into that boilerplate. Um, and you're, uh, you know, the author, the agent also knows the industry in and out. Uh, if it's a good agent, they should know all the norms, all the standards, all the things that they can push on and all the things that like publishers are just not going to agree to and you're going to be wasting your time and energy and, and, and potentially money uh, if you're hiring uh, somebody who doesn't know the industry, uh, they'll, the agent will know what are the things to push on that can that are achievable. Um, um, Johnny, I, I do want to, I see, I was just also browsing through the Q&A questions and, and I think um, I, I saw that there's a few about hybrid publishing. So I, I was wondering if, you know, we can maybe have a, a short sort of conversation about that because a uh, um, lot of questions about hybrid publishing sort of being, um, you know, uh, a, a, I guess a, a good way to sort of get out there. And again, you know, I mean, it's it's a uh, it's really up to um, it. Really depends on a lot, so many factors that I can't even really go into detail here. Where you are in your career, what goals you have um, about the book. But in short, a hybrid publisher is. Um, um, I, I like to uh, think of them as author subsidized publishing. So a hybrid publisher, they're not. It's not quite. Um, uh, self-publishing because the, the the publisher is actually doing a lot of performing a lot of functions that a traditional publisher would perform like like you know accepting the book selecting the book editing the book marketing the book in certain ways um, but uh, unlike a traditional publishing model where the author just signs a contract and gets paid for the advance and royalties a hybrid publisher the author put, fronts some of the cost uh, of uh, getting the book uh, finished. So some editorial costs and, you know, the, it's just, we've seen ranges from like 5,000 to 70,000 uh, for, for these publishers. And, um, you know, I mean, uh, the, the, the sort of basic advice that we give authors when they approach us with hybrid publishers is, look, you want to make sure see this as an investment, whatever you're, you're putting in the, the production of the book, make sure that you'll be able to earn it back. And there's a lot of like um, hybrid publishers out there with, um, you know, very successful lists that have helped authors, um, um, you know, get, get out. But again, you know, um, it's also an area where there may be a lot of bad actors uh, lurking. So um yeah, we, 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 we look at hybrid publishing contracts too. We have checklists that help authors sort of navigate that. And I do want to ask Adam, is this, are, do you ever deal with hybrid publishers in your practice or do any agents, is it? Hi, yeah, oh, I just broke up quite a bit, but I did hear the end of it, which was, do I ever deal with hybrid yeah. publishers? I'm sorry about that. Um, if there were other questions for me during that, that, that break. I mean, the, the shorter answer is, as an agent, I do not um, ask an author to pay money to be mm -hmm. published. Um, I don't fault any author for doing that, and I don't have any issues with it or, or thoughts about it, but it's just not part of our, our business model. So if an author does come to me and say, I want to pay 
uh, for like something like a hybrid publisher, um, uh, I will say, you know, great, but um, I, and maybe I'll say I'll, I'll review the contract for them. Um, I don't think I've had that experience though. Uh, so it's not something I can speak to too closely there. There's, I mean, it depends on how you define hybrid. Um, right. you know, I've seen somewhere there's like a very, uh, quite a bit of buyback that an author needs to buy a certain number of copies. Mm -hmm. Um, but in any of those cases, uh, um, I will say the contract looked or, or at least I made it look um, quite a bit like a traditional publisher, yeah. except for those specific business model changes that that um, right. that might make it fall under a hybrid clause. But the big things I'd be looking at are like rights granted, right. termination, all the things that we talked about, which really shouldn't uh, in this context change. Absolutely, absolutely, very important. You know, you. Um, you, yeah, yeah, because because the, again, the whole idea is any sort of investment that you're making, whether it's paying the publisher sort of upfront for 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 some of the costs, or um, uh, accept or buying back a certain amount of stock, so the publisher is able to um, um, defray those costs. Uh, you need to be you make sure that the rights that you're granted are you know they're they're equivalent to what you can expect to get from the contract. I mean. Uh, if a publisher ask if a hybrid publisher is asking for foreign rights, ask, you know, what are can they do for foreign publication? I mean, do they even have um, foreign distribution or deals abroad, or how successful other authors have been doing that? So those are all questions that um, you know are are yeah. I mean, they're they're relevant to traditional and hybrid publishing as well. Um, Thanks, Johnny, for letting us sort of do that sidebar. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and we did a webinar a couple of weeks ago on alternatives to traditional publishing. Great panelists, uh, mm -hmm. from Kobo, Draft to Digital, and also Brooke Warner from She Writes Press. Oh, great. Uh, yeah. was on there, and she did a good so, job explaining. Yeah, they're a great the hybrid publisher. So we can maybe send a link to that webinar in the follow-up email that we um, send here, because I think a lot of people... Yeah, and yeah, we did one on traditional publishing, too. That's a good idea. Um, all right, so we've received a number of questions about uh, audits, net receipts, things like that. Um, what's ideal? What's an ideal setup to make sure that the author is, you know, comfortable and confident with that they're going to get their royalties that they're owed later? Uh, and any other details on that front? Uh, like a like a look back period of a mm. year or two. Um. Yeah. I mean. I I think that the the and, and and again like I'll reference the 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 author's guild model contract um which we have section 20 of the model contract that has an example audit clause um sometimes what what I see in when I when I look at contracts is that the audit clause will be um the audit right will be limited to say 2 years after you get the statement so you know if you get the statement and you don't complain you know that's it. Like you're, you can't, you can't ask questions about it. You can go do an audit. Um, so the the what we and we talk about is this in the commentary of our of our clause is that it you should be able to sort of you know investigate any kind of uh, perceived um, ma yeah mis mis mispractice in 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 accounting uh, at any time. Um, and so the the audit clause ideally should be open ended. Um, you know, usually the 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 audit clause will not allow an author to conduct more than one audit in a year or in two years, and that's just you know that kind of makes sense because like if you're doing if you're one one also spend its audits are not cheap, so you're if you're spending money, you likely would be it's unreasonable to think that you'd be going in and auditing every month. Um, um, and that would be very annoying for the publisher too. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, it's an important right to have, uh, especially if a pattern starts emerging where there's, uh, you know, real concern about the publisher's accounting. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, as as a lawyer, the one thing I always do is, is start to think what's their counter argument going to be and that hopefully I can then counter the counter argument. Yeah. Um, but I do hear quite a lot of, of publishers saying like, look, we, you know, these are for life of copyright. Um, at a certain point, our records aren't going to be that accurate. Like there's statutes of limitations, like there right. should be some time limit, but, you know, look at that time limit, see where you can push, um, find something that you think is, is reasonable, um, you know. Uh, and but this clause should be detailed in your contract because this is your only option to, as the author to really see 
if there were errors being made, if there's money that you earned that are due to you that are not being paid to you? Um, what happens if an agent retires or, or dies or just disappears? Um, never. So <laughs> I'm never going to retire. Never gonna. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, again, what is in your contract? And the contract in this case I'm referring to is your author agent contract, not your publishing contract. Um, I would say probably the majority of them are contracts with an agency, not with an agent. Um, so if an individual agent retires, an individual agent uh, dies, then the um, author agent agreement will still continue to be in effect because it's with the agency. Um, but again, look at the the, the writing in, in your agency agreement because uh, that's what's going to dictate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that 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 can complicated scenarios can arise uh, if the agreement is not detailed or you don't have an agreement. Um, I mean, the simple answer, at least in terms of work that you still want representation for, is that the agency relationship will end. Um, but the more complicated answer pertains to the agent's ability to sort of continue to collect uh, um, commissions on the on the publishing contract that's still in existence. So, tricky question. Uh, in what situations would the Authors Guild contract review uh, not be totally sufficient, and they and an author might need to hire a, a private attorney? Like, right. So we don't, you know, as we we don't negotiate um, directly with the publisher. The, the way the contract review works is that the legal team looks at the contract, they identify areas that, um, you know, should be changed to make it more fair and equitable to the author and sort of provide some alternatives and suggestions. Um, if the there is there needs to be substantial negotiation on the contract, um, you know, if the if 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 yeah i mean if it's something that the the author can't really achieve if the language is really bad and they still want to work with the publisher uh then they can hire an attorney um it also just depends on the how comfortable the author is negotiating with the publisher and adam do you as an agent do you have tips for authors in requesting uh, changes to the contract how, what what kind of mindset should should someone have I don't know. That's kind of a broad question. Um, uh, so, you know, I would say uh, my biggest tip would be to know that you can negotiate. You know, I mean, uh, we operate in our lives so often clicking agreements, uh, saying yes to things and and um, publishing contracts when they when you get your default one that has absolutely no changes made that nobody's been negotiated. Uh, there's, you know, it's not through an agency where there's a boilerplate and there, it's a, just a blank default contract. There's going to be a lot of spots where you can negotiate and make it drastically better. You know, I would really point you to the grant of rights. I would really point you to the out of print and I would really point you to the option clause also um, because, you know, some option clauses, which, you know, in their most basic form is just the publisher gets to look at your next book. Um, but uh, publishers might add things onto that that say, and they can absolutely get your next book and maybe they get it at the same terms as one. And like, there's all these things that could be added there. Um, take a close look at that, negotiate wherever you can. Um, because, you know, if you have a gigantic, massive world phenomenon bestseller, should they get your next book for the exact same terms as the first one? I'd probably argue no. Um, these are really important questions that uh, I think, uh, you know, look through very closely. Uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, my default advice is hire somebody who really knows the industry and knows these contracts to, to um, go through it. Um, I know that's a tough answer because sometimes it's not feasible or, or maybe it doesn't make sense in a given situation, but uh, that's going to be my, my best advice. And there are some great books too. My other advice would be, you know, use use the Authors Guild. It's an incredible resource, um, and look through some some great books. I know there's some that uh, I've found immensely helpful over the years. Um, you know, find ones that are really well rated, and and uh, they can really point you and demystify the contracts in a, uh, a lot of these publishing contracts. 
Uh, a few authors are almost afraid to take a big advance or get a high royalty because they're afraid they're not going to sell future books because the first book failed. Um, do you have thoughts on that on that sentiment? I have so many thoughts on that sentiment. Um, you know, I've, I think there was a lot of talk for a while about this kind of like, I've heard it referred to as the death spiral, where this huge advance comes in and, and you can't recoup it. And then um, you can't sell your next book because you're viewed as like, you know, having let down the publisher or lost a lot of money. Uh, now that's real. That's not, that's not like, I'm not going to dismiss that. Um, but that is really at the end of the day with that that publisher, you know, um, unless you're talking about these kind of like over the top gigantic advances that make, you know, the major news outlets about how big these advances are, um, you know, it's not going to be broadly known among the industry exactly how much you got on your advance. Um, and it, at the end of the day, I've always found it comes down to the material in your next book. You know, if that first book didn't sell as well as you, as you wanted and you write something incredible, you're going to have another shot um, in that way. Maybe not with the same publisher. Maybe that's possible. Um, but maybe they will. Maybe they'll say they're there for it. I've seen it happen countless times, so I can't say uh, it's not going to happen. And so if we're talking about turning down a very large guaranteed offer, that's a tough thing for me to recommend because... There are a lot of unknowns in this industry. There's so much that's hard to predict. And one thing you do know is if they say this is what your advance is, that's what your advance is. Um, so, you know, if I'm advising an author, uh, there's also a lot of other factors. I, I usually end up saying, you know, take the best offer you can get. That's usually the best course of action. Um, but there's also other reasons like, you know, there's there's the sunk cost fallacy that I think happens with publishers where they say, wow, we've put so much money into this advance. We've got to make this a bestseller. And, and I've seen that happen as well. Um, so there's a lot of considerations. It's, it's hard for me to argue, take the lower, you know, lower your advance, take lower road, you know, so that you don't get into this um, spiral. The, the counter to all of that that I will say is if you're in an auction situation, you've got a few different publishers who are bidding uh, and there's one offer that's really big and one that's a little lower or, or a decent amount lower, but you really know that that publisher is the right fit. They're going to really get your book. They're, that editor is really going to know exactly how to market and, and edit it and, and just make it sing. Yeah, maybe go for the lower offer in that situation. All right, well, I think it's about time to wrap up, but finally, I'll just ask, uh, are there any particular trends over the last year or so, or trends that you foresee in the near future that authors should know about? Uh, Contract-wise, uh, well, certainly morality clauses, that's a thing that's fairly new and that is being discussed heavily uh, right now. Um, I would also say force majeure is gonna be an interesting conversation after the pandemic. You know, This is the clause that says, you know, it, if there's, you know, huge world shaking events or like, you know, things entirely out of uh, one party's control, uh, oftentimes they're referred to as like war or act of God or pandemics, um, then the one side who can't do their end of the contract is not in breach for not doing their contract. And so, you know, you might put a limit on that. You might find a way to say that's not forever. Um, but for a long time, these clauses were, were very common and you put them into a contract and, and it's just you know a, a part of most standard contracts. Uh, but now it's kind of being discussed with more uh, of a sense of, of this, let's really talk about this because it's, it's really applicable to our industry like it is for all industries right now. Well, thank you. And, uh... We can stop there for today. This has been a ton of great information. Thank you, Adam Shear of DeFiori and Company and the AALA, Umer, Kazi. Thank you for being here with us. And yeah. thanks to everyone for joining us. Thanks, uh, Adam. Thank you for having us. Thank having me. And we'll and, send uh, out a follow-up email with uh, a lot of links about covering the subjects that we've talked about. I'm thinking we'll have something on morality clauses, uh, certainly our links to the model contract, um, termination, um yep 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 Other always further reading to do always further reading lots of reading <laughs>
All right, well, thanks. And uh, everyone, uh, please go to authorsguild.org slash bootcamps, where you can find recordings of the past events and listings for upcoming events. We've got a lot more topics to cover over the next few months. And you Adam can and Mayor again, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.